good afternoon. Welcome, welcome, welcome to what I know will be an exciting conversation this afternoon. I'm Shani Hostin, and I am truly, truly blessed to lead the African American and Black strategy work on behalf of our multicultural leadership team at AARP. But as we've heard this week, we don't do it alone. And so I want to thank my AARP colleagues and my sister leaders here. Shout out. Thank you. We are certainly happy to continue our collaboration with Black Enterprise in support of the Women of Power Summit. And what a fabulous summit it has been. Do you agree? But we are especially excited to present today's Conversations That Count, this brunch this afternoon. So many of you may have heard of AARP or heard about the card that shows up around your 50th birthday. Anyone have heard about that? Well, AARP is much more than the, the card and the discounts. While that is great, we are really the nation's largest nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, and for over 60 years, we have been dedicated to advocating for and empowering Americans 50 and older to choose how they live as they age. We are a global thought leader on aging and really helping to influence the conversation globally on what it is to age and to continue to live our best lives. We have a major national president, 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 presence across offices in every city. So I encourage you, we talked a lot about partnerships this week, I encourage you to reach out to your local AARP office. We have state offices in every state, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. AARP is committed to the African American and black community, and we recognize the role that we women play. Conversations like this really enable us to share our stories of how we've overcome barriers, our challenges as powerful women, not only in corporate America, but also in Hollywood, and frankly, throughout all of our communities across the globe. We are thrilled about having Lynn Whitfield here, sharing her journey of success this afternoon, and navigating her career in an ever-changing industry. And frankly, she's a fantastic example of what our CEO, Joanne Jenkins, calls disrupting aging. Any Greenleaf fans? Yeah. So through our Disrupt Aging platform, AARP is changing the conversation of what it means to age. We're empowering people, especially those 50 plus, by providing tools and resources to help individuals understand how we can live more active lives, decrease our financial burdens, and live in an even more happy, productive lives as we age, is what we call at AARP our health, self, and wealth. And we've recent, recently launched our new Sisters Digital Newsletter, which is written by black women for black women. And so our sisters from AARP Newsletter, we celebrate black women as we deliver real talk, real information for real sisters. The newsletter covers topics including style, health, money, relationships, careers, getting our side hustle on, and lots more. We've provided information at your tables today, and I encourage you to each sign up to receive this free digital subscription if you haven't already done, done so. And we can continue the conversation of, within our community once we leave the summit. So again, we are proud to partner with Black Enterprise in support of this amazing Women of Power Summit and excited to continue the conversation this afternoon around disrupting aging and exploring the secret to evergreen success. Thank you and enjoy the conversation. Thank you, Shaney and AARP for this very special treat. Our featured guest, Lynn Whitfield, has portrayed rich and complex characters for nearly four decades on both the big and small screens. Roles that have made great topics of conversation or captured us in ways that made her characters indelibly memorable. Whether powerful or vulnerable, her character-driven women have grasped the lives of every woman. Perhaps Lynn's most iconic role was that of her portrayal of Josephine Baker, one of the most successful black entertainers of her time and a civil rights leader of historical stature, bringing the sultry, controversial entertainer back to life, earned Lynn an Emmy 
for her memorable performance in the critically acclaimed The Josephine Baker Story. And today, there is Lady May. Yes, the matriarch and proud First Lady of the Calvary Fellowship World Ministries Megachurch in Memphis from Greenleaf on the OWN Network. Lady May reigns supreme while keeping everyone and their multitude of problems in check and hidden from the public. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a rousing Women of Power welcome to a legend and American treasure. Please welcome Lynn Whitfield. This dress is everything. Oh, <laughs> Tracy Reese. Yes. It's so appropriate to have you here at the yes. Women of Power Summit. Thank you. Because you've made a career out of playing powerful black women. Thank you. From the Josephine Baker story to Greenleaf and many roles in between. What drew you to these roles? Well, I just really feel that the, this country, the world, needs to be introduced to women who take more charge of their lives, who feel entitled to be here, who are taking care of business, who are making sure that their families are taken, and all the time being kind of glamorous and fabulous while they do it. <laughs> we work yes. hard, we work overtime, and I have taken it as my personal charge to, to share those women, to breathe life into them so that people know we exist. As a matter of fact, just looking over this room and my dear friend Caritha, who helped me to be bestowed with the honor of being with you today. And I just want to say, I feel so good being here. And like they used to say at my daughter's uh, school, you should turn around and give yourselves a pat on the back because you're <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> really, really. So you've said that it's hard to understand strong women. What is it that you think makes us so misunderstood? Well, it is hard to understand strong women because, oh, you all excuse me, but I think this belt is making me look bunchy. Oh, to understand strong women. People often say to me <clears throat> in this current woman that, you know, that I've breathed life into, that thanks to all of you is becoming an iconic character mm -hmm. that will stand the test yes. of time, like Brandy Webb from Thin Line and, you know, mm -hmm. the woman in Eve's Bayou and Josephine Baker. I think Lady May will be around a long time. Now, here's the thing. I don't quite understand why a woman who is taking care of her business, who is absolutely very clear uh, in her vision of what her life should be, what her career should be, and is able to articulate that, why, as a man, that would be like, yeah, he's a real boss. Mm -hmm. But for women, it's more like, she's mean, or, you know, she's so hard, or, it's so, it's, I think that it's not as much of a racial thing as it is a gender bias thing. Mm -hmm. That women should not be allowed 
to, you know, get upset, be straight forth in what they want to say, lay down the law the way we all feel, the way you feel it should be. So, you know, we get labeled with, you know, why are you so mean? Why are you so hard? Why is she? So I do think that women can be misunderstood, but then, you know, that's where that thing comes in of using everything that God gave us. And how many of us know God gave us some amazing stuff, right? Yeah. Like my grandmother used to say, you not only have to look good, but you have to be good. So I think that for me, as I try to negotiate bringing these women to the screen, because it's not always easy, I have to fight for who they are. When I started Lady May, they said, the stern um, matriarch of the green leaf family. And all I could see was a really ugly bun and some bad <laughs> shoes. <laughs> And you know, some kind of loosey-goosey St. John's that weren't quite on top of things. And I said, no! <laughs> but I couldn't say no, like, well, no, this is how it's gonna be. I had to, you know, say, well, you know, she's a Southern woman. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's charm with that. And of course, you know, they always wanna look their best. And she really cares for her family. She just thinks she knows what's best. So I had to communicate in a way using my femininity, which is a part of our woman power. It really is an important part of our power because I don't know anybody else last time I checked that can, you know, people the earth. Of course we need help, but we're <laughs> doing it for nine months. So yeah. yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Give yourselves a... What takes 60 seconds for a man is nine months for a woman. <laughs> Feet, ankles, hands, nose swelling up. So what we're doing is we are the nurturers. So I try to remember that all right, calm down. <laughs> you all can write Hollywood and tell them I should do a comedy next, maybe. <laughs> but but, but, but I, I'm just saying that I think another part of what makes it misunderstood is that people inherently with black women want to be nurtured by us. You know, I don't know if that comes from slavery or the tit nannies or the people who held the family together while they were out doing what, but they want to be nurtured. So I try to redirect the conversation in a nurturing way mm -hmm. um, until I have to put my foot down. Right. Um, so that, so that, you know, I can bring truth to what I do in my work, as I'm sure all of you want to do, truth and success, you know, um, strength and productivity. But I, I think it is important to use the, majesty and magic of our womanliness. Well, speaking of to get womanhood, what we want. What? you mentioned your grandmother. Yes. Who were the role models and personal influences that helped you develop your ideals of black womanhood? Oh, m my grandmother was a really soft-spoken woman on one side, my maternal grandmother, Estelle Duvall Butler. She was, you know, very soft-spoken and and, and in the home, they were both homemakers. My other grandmother was extremely, you know, uh, regal and all of that, but they were just wonderful women. And then my mother, who ended up being, at starting at the age of 50 to be president of Louisiana Housing Finance Agency, <laughs> at 50, helping people who had combined incomes of $20,000, $15,000 own their own homes. And yes, and learned how to take care of them through workshops. So my mother was a very strong example for me. Oh, and then there's Ruby D, and there's Dr. Angelo, and there's, you know, uh, Diana Sands, and so many. You know, I'm like a sponge. You know, I'm a mercenary. I'll take it wherever I can get it. Y'all got some influence for me to help me be better? Come on, tell me, please, you know?
I really am a work in progress, so <clears throat> I take my inspiration from everywhere. from everywhere. I'm inspired today. We can't talk about powerful black women in this country without mentioning Oprah. Yes. You star opposite her. Yes. On a show that is produced by her. Yes, ma'am. That airs on her network. Yes. <laughs> How does it feel when you are looking at a role and someone tells you, Oprah really only sees you for this? I said, oh my God, she has such great taste. <laughs> <laughs> But really, really, as I told you, as I read this character on the page, I said, well, why does Oprah want me to do this? Anybody could do this. And, uh, and then when I found out that it would be a more collaborative environment where they encouraged me and the characters in the show, the actors in the show, to really help build these characters. But it is, in fact, a great honor, a great vote of confidence that, you know, it's not about, you know, reading for it or proving anything. To have a woman like Oprah Winfrey say, no, you got this, I know you got this, and I want you. It's just a, a blessing and an honor, so I was very, very flattered. The show touches on so many topics, but yes. I think one of the recurring themes is how the women on the show show up for each other, protect each other, have each other's back, or... Fuss with each other. Right. Yeah. In many cases, they yes. don't. In many cases, they don't. And I know as a storyteller, it's really important for you to be able to hold up that mirror. What is it we need to see about ourselves? Well, you know, the great thing about acting is that I, I see acting as a service business. Um, and my storytelling is to serve as a mirror of humanity, human nature, behavior, uh, so that a controlling mother, of course, that would be none of you all out there. <laughs> uh, you, none of you think you know better what your child needs than they do, right? But, 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 you know, so that my job is to show you things about humanity that may inspire you, or things about humanity and a human being that you will say, you know what, I don't want to make this mistake. Let me learn from what I am seeing here and see if there's anything of me in it. So part of the service is me serving as a mirror in bringing these characters to the fore um, so that you can see what you don't want to do. Maybe get some ideas or something. How many of us know that Brandy Webb, the lady in Thin Line Between Love and Hate, we don't want to be that, right? <laughs> never. Not successful women like us. We would never, ever, you know, exhibit ourselves like hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. We would never do that. But, you know, the mirror is, if somebody makes you that pissed off, then, you know, just get on up out of there. Don't, you know, bother yourself by getting that angry about it, you know? So that's a lesson. And I think there are lots of lessons that we can learn from the Greenleaf family. And, and we're not done, but, but um, yes. So I'm always excited that I get to maybe bring some healing or some uh, stimulating a thought or something like that for, for the audience who been so kind to support so much of what I've done in my career. Speaking of healing, you said that uh, one of the reasons you think that women don't show up for other women has to do with the insecurities that we carry around because of the programming that we've received our whole lives. You know, I, I, it's hard to understand because the sisterhood of women and our power, if we're all pulling together, I think is just so amazing. But in the programming that we receive, I mean, like even in the Bible, right? I looked in the Bible now, and we're in Genesis, right? And I look in the Bible, and I'm like, well, I was talking to somebody, and she happened to be the first lady of a church, right? So she says, ooh. 
I got the flashes. I have all this stuff going on. I said, oh, we women, we have so much going on. But you know what? It's all Eve's fault. <laughs> so I'm saying, you know, I have a kind of good researcher's head. So I go to the first verse of the Bible, and I mean, the first chapter, but I'm looking, and in fact, Eve ate the damn apple. <laughs> so all of a sudden, it became Eve's fault. So even, and I am a Christian, and I love the Lord, but even in the Bible, in the first book that we read, the woman has something to be blamed for. So we get that programming, even in our Bible. We get that programming in magazines when we see these 12-year-old, 20-pound people. And <laughs> <laughs> we get it in, you know, we get it in the workplace, you know, gender bias, age bias. We get it from our boyfriends, our husbands, our whatever, you know, like a comparison thing that may happen. We just get it. We just get all this, you know, information that can bring us down. And so what happens in my experience, and this is only from my experience because I'm just me, what happens is that when we come to some other female relationships, sometimes what we bring is all that insecurity with us. Oh, did I get a yes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, okay. So then we're all together on this. So we will tend to be, to, to allow coming from that corner of things, of our insecurity, to see somebody beautiful who walks in a room, to see somebody whose husband may be richer than yours, with somebody with a, you know, a more expensive Louis Vuitton or whatever, or, you know, than you have, or the grass is always greener on the other side. And we come to something that could be an amazing relationship, an amazing liaison, and we come to it with insecurity and, you know, we start judging it keeps us I think sometimes from our gifts and we sis right yes yes and we won't even get into Jezebel spirits and all of that and stuff that comes all out <laughs> so I said oh God <laughs> well let me just see if I can entice what is that what is that that is nothing but something for the devil so here, let me just get back to Eve, right? <laughs> so, so in my researcher's head, I went back and I said, okay, so Eve ate the apple, but you know, Adam was there. She came from his rib, so I don't understand. Then I said, so we're in, they're in a place with all of the vegetation of everything that God ever created in the world. And the first skirt was, made of fig leaves, and she covered herself in shame, right? So I said to myself, God, what the heck? Why the fig leaf? Why did the first woman have to walk out in shame because of a mistake that she made? So look what I, I did. <clears throat> you did your research. I have to do, I have to know. <laughs> I mean, even with God in the name of Jesus Christ, sometimes you have to look for the answers deeper and say, touch me, tell me, show me, heal me. So I went to pedaltalk.com, which is a botanical sort of information index of what things are. And according to the Huffington Post, by, by a botanist of pet, uh, petals.com, figs are technically not a fruit. They are inverted flowers. Fig trees don't flower like apples and peaches. Their flowers bloom from the inside. The pear-shaped pod, which later matures into a fruit that we eat. So what it really means and the, the figs are mentioned so often in the Bible, right? 
and in scripture, mentioned over and over, like 50 times it's mentioned. So the fig tree was extremely important for both nutritional and economic reasons in ancient times when things were well in Israel. And it, what figs mean is that it's prosperous. So what Eve covered herself with that was supposed to be in shame, right? Walking out like this, God directed her to take a fig leaf, a fig leaf, which is the leaf of a fruit that is really a flower that blossoms from the inside. So when you open a fig and you see all those individual little parts of it and you think it like it's just like that's what the fruit looks like, those are buds and petals of a flower. So Eve was directed to cover her shame with the promise of blossoming. So guess what? <laughs> guess what, ladies? If some little young chick comes in and is sideways trying to move you outside of your job, <laughs> or if there's a divorce, or if there's a bad something that happens to you, losing a loved one, losing things, things that hurt you, and you feel shame, and you feel vulnerable, and you feel, just remember Eve. Because when she covered herself in shame, she covered herself with the promise of blossoming. Because out of every bad thing, something good can come. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Do I look fat like this? Did I? No. <laughs> should I? Maybe I should tie it. I, I don't know. I just want you to remember me well. <laughs> Insecurities, right? Yes. Because you know we're we'll walking somewhere, we'll be pulling and tugging and wondering, <laughs> did I wear the right shoes? Well, that's how I'm feeling right now. You look gorgeous. Well, it's all right. You I'll look just do this. Gorgeous. Okay. <laughs> we're gonna start taking questions in a minute, so if you guys could line up if you have questions for Lynn. <laughs> but but before Lady May gets all the way through her Women's Day sermon. <laughs> yeah. I know, right? <laughs> I, I want to talk to you about aging, and you told me you hate to talk about aging. I don't talk about that. I'm happy this was AARP, <laughs> but listen, if y'all putting, <laughs> if you are putting me on blast like that, then we need a branding opportunity, darling. I don't want to give. <laughs> <that. laughs> I, I, they said we're going to talk about aging. I said what? <laughs> Okay, all right, all right, but let me calm down. I'm gonna calm, yes. see, I lost you my lost shoe. shoe, it makes me nervous. Okay, all right, all right, here we go, here but we go. But you have such a positive approach to it that age doesn't have to change your outlook on life, that it doesn't have to make you stagnant. I mean, talk about- Well, here's the thing. I think that aging is, has to do with getting sedentary and sedentary in our bodies you know, so keep stretching, ladies. It's really important. <laughs> um, but sedentary in our passion. When we get sedentary in our vision of life, like, well, this is how it is, and everything, and I'm all state. I, I think continuing to find something that makes you, that you're passionate about, that you're excited about, because I honestly still feel like a kid with a nose pressed up against a glass at a candy store. Saying, ooh, I want to produce now. Ooh, I want to design. Ooh, I have so many, ooh, I want to go and do 
you know, travel by land and do different African countries, which I did South Africa this year. I spent five months, yeah. I mean, five weeks <laughs> in South Africa. I met designers. I, I just culturally, you know, ooh, those lions. And I realized that, you know, animals really, we are like animals, you know? We saw so much behavior that was inspiring and interesting to me. So I just feel like, Age is a number, but staying excited is what young people bring to the table. You know, they're excited about something, and there is nothing in a number that says you don't find something that you're inspired about, excited about, and all of that. In fact, my friends who sit down and start with this thing, you know young people, honey, I don't know. You know, they need to learn, and they need, you know, and, you know, life is just, uh, you know, we're here, and. Everything is so planned and structured and no surprises. I don't, I don't think it's good for, you know, staying excited about it all. And, 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 and you know, there's a youthfulness in the, in, in the heart is just the most amazing thing. I mean, I think it takes us a long way. Yeah. We're going to take questions. Hi. Hi. Go ahead. Is it on? It's not on. We can hear you. I'll repeat All right. the question. There, there, we go. Go. there we go. Marcy Jones uh, with Urban Connoisseurs from Seattle. I'm a wine consultant, everybody, for black winemakers. Got to put that oh. plug in. I just want to say I love, love, love you and your acting. And one of my favorite movies was The Other Woman. Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> that was an amazing movie. And I have, I know someone who recently found out that her mother was not her birth mother. And she is having a hard time understanding her identity. Mm. And just, if you could maybe share some words of encouragement that I could give her on how to move forward in life. Well, well here's the thing. I think that, you know, we, can't choose our parents, right? Our parents are chosen, or maybe somewhere in the ether and the heavenlies we choose, right? But once we get past um, our family, then what happens is we get to choose the second layer of family that surrounds our lives. And we have nothing to do with who our mother and father may be. But we do get to choose our tribe and who we want to spend our lives with. We do have the experience, life experiences, the sociological part of our lives. And all of that stays intact. What God has led her to be, to feel, to express on this earth will never change because ultimately, you know, you have one father, mother that is consistent no matter what, you know, and that is Father, Mother, God, you know, and for me, it's in the name of Jesus Christ. It could be, you know, Allah for some of you, it could be, but the fact is, is that the real parenting that is necessary for her soul will not, will not change okay. because of knowing that her mother was not her mother or this is a new mother. And I don't know, to try to do things with love, and an open heart um, helps me to not get bitter, to not stay sad, you know, to, to embrace this new information and see, you know, what, what promise of a blossom may be inside of it for her, Yeah. you know? We're gonna take the next question from over here. Okay. Hi, how are you? Ishina Roman, Chief Strategy Officer with the Intuition Consulting Firm. Um, I actually technically have two questions. One. One, please. I, I got it. Or I'll answer, I'll, I'll, do, I'll give a short answer. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. I'll so, give a short answer to two. Okay. One was skincare regimen, please. And second was when you're a, a woman tr endeavoring to be extraordinary, it can be really difficult. It can kind of wear your spirit down at times. But when you, what? When, you when you're what? a woman trying to be extraordinary, it can be really difficult, right? Oh that challenge God. can wear your spirit down. But you always, anytime I've seen you, you have such an air of vitality and joy, how do you maintain that, as well as your skincare? All okay. right, well. <laughs> Thank you. Skincare. Well, skincare, first of all, I try to use as many natural things as I can. So, you know, argon oil, or, 
and things like that. And, and I use those, those jade rolling pin things are great, you know, because they keep all the fluid out and puffiness out. Exfoliation is important. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking for things for discoloration because black women, you know, age more with discoloration than we do with wrinkles, thank God. <laughs> we could do that, you know, it's gotta be something somewhere though. Um, um, yeah, but exfoliation is great. Getting all the dead skin off mm -hmm. and then, because you can be putting all those creams and everything on dead skin. So it's better to get down to what is the live, really good skin that we could soak it in. So that's one thing. And then vibrant. Let me tell you, I walked from across this thing about four times today trying to get ready for y'all. I was so exhausted. I walked back there and I said, this is no way to start something trying to inspire people. I'm exhausted. But I mean, you know, like I said, staying excited. I'm excited to be here with you. I'm excited to share with you and to realize why you're doing it sometimes is important. And also then to go back and do the recounting of the blessings that you've already received and the progress that you've already made. Well, I did this, I did that, I did that. Okay, God, that's coming along, all right, you know? So that kind of thing, you know? And it tends to, um, and then sometimes you just need to lay down and take a rest and say, you know, I just need to take yeah. a rest, go get in some steam, rejuvenate. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. We get tired. Yes. You know? All right, Thank let's you. take this question over here. Hi, my name is Demetrius Owens and I work for Walmart. I am an HR manager. Oh. And I just wanted to say that your spirit is just amazing. You two are doing a great job, by the way. But <laughs> um, you remind me of my aunt who is just the world to me and your movements, the way you talk, speak, everything. And I've ha been having this question and it's burning in my spirit. And I'm like, why won't I ask it? Why won't I ask it? Ask it. And so now, no, it was, it was, it was burning this whole conference. And so I realized you were the person I was meant to ask this question to. Okay. And this question, um, because of your spirit and who you are, I want to ask you, what Bible verse do you rely on to continue to keep you strong and moving forward? Because the way that you are authentically you and unpredictable in the way you speak. We don't know where you're going and what times you're gonna say, but you end, up, you end up in the right that is place true. every time. So I know so, you have to be depending your on Bible something verse. above you. What scripture do you rely on? Well, you know, I don't know. It can change if somebody has really pissed me off and like it's really, I know I'm in the middle of something, you know, my feet are shot with the preparation of the gospel feet. I am, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because we're not warring against flesh and blood, but against principalities and rulers of darkness of this earth. Oh, yeah. That's one, you know? Yeah. And then just a promise of what being, being, you know, Proverbs 30, well, you know, what, what being, you know, a fabulous woman it is. Cause it's like, Damn, God, really? That's a lot to do, you know, but just, and the fact that I'm loved, you know, mm -hmm. reminding myself that I'm a daughter of a king, so that makes me a princess, and that means that I deserve to be here, and that means that the promise of, you know, that everything's going to be all right, that I'm not in this by myself. It's a lot of things in the New Testament that really inspire me, you know, about the unconditional love. I kind of stay away from revelations because I want to love, I want to love God because I love not because I'm terrified. So, you know, I cherry pick. <laughs> okay. Question over here. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Amanda Diamond. I'm an actor also, and we're here at Women of Power and in rooms and auditions or as an actor, you're told you're irreplaceable, that you're the least powerful one in the room. Um, and I know I'm not, not powerful. So how do you- You know you're not what? Not powerful. Sorry for the double Oh, negative. you know you're know not, not not powerful. I okay, yeah, the powerful. double negative is bothering me. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> I know I am powerful. How yes. Do you, okay. <laughs> how do you protect that knowing of your power in rooms where people try to take it away from you? Well, power isn't just bestowed on you just because you know you're powerful. Power is bestowed on you because you make yourself valuable in these regards, right? You know what I mean? And sometimes they don't choose you in the audition room, 
But when you walk in with the authority of this might not be quite who you see this character to be, but you know what, I'm not walking in. Into, I'm walking in with an idea. I'm walking in with something. This is my idea of who she is. And if you have anything to say, you know, we can work on that. But you walk in with your idea. You don't walk in in fear that you're not going to be who they want you to be. So you're so busy and occupied with bringing your, like every woman in here, when they have a business plan, when they have something they want to do, you're so busy showing them your idea, being your idea, when it comes to acting, being that woman, you don't have time to think about who thinks you're powerful or not. Okay. And Thank last you. question here. Hi, Ms. Whitfield. My name is Jennifer Harris. I'm a real estate broker from Raleigh, North Carolina. And my question is, in my newly released book, The Black Woman's Declaration of Independence, I write about how we've had to declare things over our lives and also in our lives. So I would like to ask you, what have you had to declare as far as declarations for your success in career and in life? Well, I guess that's what we've been talking about this whole time. You know, that how I do it, I, 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 I guess I, I guess I declare it, you know, um, but I declare that, you know, that my daughter will be, you know, a happy, fulfilled woman in her life. I, I know that there are still so many stories I want to tell. I know that I want to live a very long time and continue to grow. And I, I guess it's called, a, some people may call it a, declaration or an affirmation or a prayer or envisioning your life. So it's, it's kind of semantic, but I think, yeah, I declare almost everything, if that's the word you use. Yes. Yes. So I know that you pull inspiration from so many of the black women who have come before us and yes. their writings. Yes. And that your daughter Grace is here. Yeah. All right. So... I figured people don't really, you know, want an actress to come to talk because you all really only want me here because of my acting and, <laughs> and what I do. I mean, I'm no lecturer or anything like that, you know, I, so I, <laughs> I um, you know, always like to leave something with people who, you know, are patient enough to sit through my babble, like she said, you never know where she's going to end up, but you always end up in the right place. So, <laughs> so, um, so sometimes I just pull inspiration from the women who have inspired me. And some of those women are Nikki Giovanni, Ruby D, Dr. Angelo. And so I just pulled a few little things together. Um, that I would leave with you in the way of, you know, entertainment. Um, do we have time for that or you all, we do? Yeah. Oh, we do, okay. Yeah. All right. So um, my daughter is here and she was a Columbia student who decided she wanted to go to Berkeley College of Music. And um, so, and we've never done this. So we're gonna do a mother-daughter thing of me uh, sharing some of these words with you. Grace, please come out. This is come one on of out, my, Grace. my best creation. <laughs> Hi, Grace. Your mic is off. There we go. Thank you so much. And then where's my music stand? Music stand flying in. Oh my God. All right, Black Enterprise. Let's pull it together here. So, um, well, okay, well I can see that. But I think I can see. So, <laughs> oh, they gave me the long arm, okay. So, um, because these words are sometimes inspiring for me. And when I'm feeling, you know, number one, let me just say for all the men in here, in here with all this estrogen, let's give them an applause and like say, 
Yes! Yes, for the gentleman willing to put up with all this woman talk. Yes! We applaud you. We appreciate you. <laughs> so, you know, one of the things that I think we forget sometimes is to live in the moment, to just be where we are. Because we're so busy oft times thinking of what happened in the past that we're upset about and what we've got to do in the future that we, woo, something fabulous could be right before our eyes and, and we don't see it because we're preoccupied, right? So this is um, a little short piece that actually was the favorite of Bea Richards' grandmother, too many times removed, and Bea Richards was the woman who was Sidney Poitier's mother, and guess who's coming to dinner, right? And so, and so Ruby D has this as the prologue in her book of poetry, my one good nerve, and we know what that feels like. Somebody's getting on your one good nerve, it's down, yeah, okay? So this is called Today is Ours. And when, hi, Stark. <laughs> now I'm nervous, she's right in my face. <laughs> so today is ours, and I kind of envision, and y'all can take this trip with me, right? Because we're in here in the casinos out there. But if we're just in a a place like some Caribbean place where the sun is just streaming down and warming our skin and, you know, the sand and our toes and the ocean is just kind of, or sea just rolling in. And I, I kind of like that Brazilian samba thing, right? Can we hear her? Yes. Go, baby. And it kind of goes like this. It says, today is ours. Let's live it. And love is strong. Let's give it. A song can help. Let's sing it. And peace is dear. Let's bring it. The past is gone, don't rue it. Our work is here, let's do it. The world is wrong, let's right it. The battle hard, let's fight it. The road is rough, let's clear it. The future vast, don't fear it. Is faith asleep? Let's wake it. Because today, this day, this very day is ours. Let's take it. I love her. <laughs> so now, you know, sometimes we just can't be all at the beach and everything. And you know, things happen in the middle of our day or our work day or our social lives that, you know, it can be disappointing. So Ruby D wrote this poem. Now, how many of you know Ruby D was a real survivor? Hi, officer. No, Ruby D was a real activist, a real woman, a real mother. And like you know, somebody told me, don't be listening to nobody who ain't living the life you want to live. You take instruction from people who've done it. So, have you ever seen those girls jump in double dutch? 
Jump, yeah, just double dutch, and those ropes will be just going, 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 and, and, and it'll smack them on the leg, and they fall out, or they fall down, and they get up, and they just go at it again. So here's a little poem that Ruby D wrote that says, <clears throat> oh, oh, girl, you broke your stride. Did that put a dent in your pride? Aww. That's all right, my little friend. Don't get mad. Don't jump bad. Reassess the situation. Then make another evaluation. Then take a deep breath. <sighs> Say a little prayer. And jump right back in there. Boom goes the weasel. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> So sometimes when I'm annoyed, I'll just hear her words. I'm like, let me just get back in here like that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So this last one that I'm going to do, and thank you for your patience. Everybody in the back, are y'all paying attention to me? All right. Thank you. So, all right. This, this piece that I do was really, and we might need a little help from you, and you can chime in if you want to. But this piece that I do, you know, it's a very famous poem. And it was written by Dr. Angelo. So somebody heard me do it for, a, I don't know, a UNICEF thing or something. And they said, you've got to do it for Dr. Angelo, and you're going to be her birthday gift, and I want you to come and do it. And I was terrified. So the day came, I got up to do this speech. Dr. Angela was there, by then she was still in a wheelchair. And so I said, Dr. Angela, I have to tell you, I'm terrified because what you do and what I've heard people do is a very dignified, marvelous piece of work. I do as a gut bucket, low down, nasty. Mississippi blues. Uh, kind of goes like this. Uh, uh. And then she said, I wrote it as a blues. And I was like, oh, thank God. Ready? Can y'all hear the guitar at all? Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, okay. But, ready? Oh, sookie, sookie, now here come the stage manager. I know we got to wrap it up. Here we go. Bow, bow. Y'all can clap. We know you got real. Goes though. like this. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like Dust I rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Cause I walk like I got oil wells uh, pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns uh, with the certainty of tides. Just like hope springing high, still I rise. <laughs> Did you wanna see me broken? Bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cry. Does my haughtiness offend you? Woo! Don't you take it awfully hard. <laughs> well, I laugh like I got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You can shoot me with your words. You can cut me with your eyes. You can kill me with your hatefulness. But still like air I rise. Ooh, the I rise. I rise. I rise. I rise. I rise. This is why I think they got so mad about Barack and Michelle in the White House. You know why? They were brilliant and they had swag. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And so, 
This verse goes like this. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Wait. <laughs> Out of the hearts of history, shame I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling. I bear with the tide, leaving behind the nights of fear and terror. I rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear. Bringing the gifts my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise. Sing it, you rise. I rise. You rise. Come on. I rise. I rise. Well, you rise. Sing Women, you rise. That's right. I forgot y'all in business. Y'all get shy. Well, we you rise. rise. Go ahead, Grace. We rise. We rise. Oh, Lord, we rise. Ladies of empowerment, be women. Grace. Yeah. <laughs> rise. We rise. <laughs> Y'all rise. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Mom. Ah. <laughs> A room of the most amazing women. Uh-huh. My daughter, Grace Gibson. Take a bow. <laughs>